the arm of the Lord. As we face 2024 and all the challenges it may bring, we thought it would be nice to consider the powerful help that we have on our side to deal with all of the experiences we will face this coming year. You know, this help has been available to all of those who've been following God's leading ever since the creation of man. This same help is available to us if we will but ask for it. Perhaps the most familiar scripture that refers to the arm of the Lord is found in Isaiah 53 and verse 1. Isaiah writes, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In the New Testament, we find this phrase specifically linked to our Lord Jesus at the end of his earthly ministry and recorded for us in John 12, verse 37 and 38. And though Jesus had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? But why did God use this illustration to describe our Lord Jesus? This afternoon, we're going to spend a little time talking about what an arm is and what makes it special. And then we're going to discuss the phrase, the arm of the Lord, with respect to major features of God's plan, with respect to creation, with respect to the nation of Israel and its liberation from the bondage of Egypt, its conflicts with other nations, and its regathering and salvation in connection with our Lord's return. And as we do this, we want to see what lessons we can derive from these experiences and promises for us for 2024. Now, one of the lessons we want you to take away from our discussion is best expressed by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 32 and verse 17. Our Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. What is an arm? Vocabulary.com defines an arm as a limb on the upper part of a person's body. You can call the front limb of any animal an arm, although they are more often called legs. While most land-dwelling mammals and even reptiles and amphibians, many of them have four limbs, most of them have four legs and no arms. Only a few have arms as their front limbs. And so what's the difference between an arm and a leg? Legs are used primarily to change location, while arms are primarily used to do work. Arms are used to grasp, hold, lift, move, build, assemble objects or individuals, or even to hug. Now, animals such as birds and others who do not have arms can do many similar things with their beaks, their mouths, or their front legs. But the arm with its attached hand make this work much easier and more natural. Coupled with a hand, it features an opposing thumb. The arm is an incredibly useful limb. Properly jointed, the arm can grasp and lift objects or people with great dexterity. It can assemble multiple objects into a single item. It can swing or use a tool. It can protect its owner against enemies. It can throw an object or it can hug and express emotion. This reminds us of the scripture in Isaiah 59, 1, Behold, the, our, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. The usefulness of an arm and its associated hand is found in nature, actually throughout nature. In nature, monkey and apes have arms, and they use them for grasping and building and caring as well as for Movement for locomotion. Raccoons have front limbs that can function as arms as well as legs. And because their front feet can function as hands, they use them for grasping. You know, these, com- these capabilities remind us of the words found in Ezekiel, excuse me, in Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter in verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no activity 
or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol or the grave where you are going. We must, as Jesus expressed it, John 9, 4, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. You know, while Jesus made this statement specifically with regard to himself and his mission at his first advent, this principle is applicable to every child of God. But why does God use the illustration of an arm? To describe the various aspects of the work God needs accomplished for his plan for man's salvation to be successful. Psalms 92, verses 1 and 2. Oh, sing a song to the Lord, a new song. For he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Notice how this verse links God's right hand and holy arm together, indicating that both of them have gained him the victory. Because God's plan of salvation required a ransom, and because God cannot die, God needed an agent to give his life a ransom for Adam. And that agent was our Lord Jesus Christ. His holy arm gained him the victory and will make known God's salvation and righteousness to the nations in due time. As the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Timothy, the second chapter and verse 5 and 6, for there is one God, and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Our Lord Jesus not only humbled himself to be made flesh, but humbled himself unto the death of the cross that he might be that ransom. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6 reveals to us another part of the arm's work, God's plan of salvation needed a high priest who would serve as a mediator to bring mankind back to perfection and harmony with God after they had been released from the condemnation of death. Apostle Paul explains this for us in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verses five and six. So also Christ did not glorify himself to be this high priest, but it was God who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says in another passage, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Apostle Paul adds in Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 10, reading from Philip's, Son though he was, he had to prove the meaning of obedience through all that he suffered. Then when he had been proved the perfect son, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who should obey him being now recognized by God himself as high priest after the order of Melchizedek. In this role, Paul writes in Hebrews, the ninth chapter in verse 15, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that by since the death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. You know, in this role as mediator, Jesus shields the human family from divine justice, while at, in his role as high priest, he teaches them righteousness and brings them up the highway of holiness back to perfection and harmony with God. But why does God use the illustration of a hand as well as an arm? He uses the arm and the hand to illustrate different aspects of the work that his plan of salvation will accomplish. And sometimes we find the terms used together as we find in Deuteronomy 26 in verse 8. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror and with signs and wonders. While the arm conveys the thought of reach and strength, the hand conveys this idea of not only strength, but protection and care, as well as punishment. Second Chronicles 26 reads, O Lord, God of our fathers, power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. Frequently, when the prophets received visions or strength or help from God in particular ways, 
it's described by the phrase, the hand of the Lord was upon or with them. God's punishments of Israel or its enemies are frequently described with the phrase, I will stretch out my hand against the particular party. But we like the way the prophet Isaiah described it in Isaiah 64 and verse 8. But now, our Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter and all of us are the work of your hand. We as new creatures in Christ Jesus are the work of God's hands. But Israel is also the work of God's hands, as we read in Joshua, the fourth chapter, and verse 23 and 24. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you had crossed over, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. All those who submit themselves to God's leading and direction, either in the past or in the present or in the future, become the work of God's hand. God first used his arm in respect to creation of the universe and all that dwells therein. The prophet Jeremiah brings this to our attention in Jeremiah 32 and verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. It was the Logos. Our Lord in his pre-human existence who used the wisdom and power of God to make the heavens and the earth. Apostle John tells us this in John, the first chapter, verses 3 and 10. All things came into being through him, meaning the Logos. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. The Lord was made through him, and the world did not know him. And the Apostle Paul confirms this for us in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. In the last days, God has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. So we find that the Logos was the arm of Jehovah even before he came to earth to redeem mankind. So what's the lesson for us in this? The wisdom and power we see exercised by the Logos in the creation of the heavens and the earth is exercised for us in providing for our spirit begettal and then the hope of a spiritual reward for us if we're faithful as followers of Christ. You know, the Apostle Paul writes about this great power exercised by God on our behalf in Ephesians, the first chapter, beginning with verse 18. Paul writes, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the surprising, surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, and put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. The same great power that God exercised when he raised Jesus from the dead, that same great power is exercised on our behalf to beget us to a new nature as a new creature and is working on our behalf through the arm of the Lord, our Lord Jesus, that we might gain that promised spiritual reward. The next most significant use of the arm is found in Israel's deliverance from Egypt, as God mentioned this to Moses in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 34. Or has a God tried to take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials and signs and wonders and by war and by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm and bright and by great terrors as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? God uses the illustration of both a hand and an arm here to describe how he had liberated Israel from Egypt. And Moses mentions this in the very next chapter of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 5.15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Israel was slaves in Egypt. They had no power to free themselves from Egypt's grip. 
But God, with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, liberated them from bondage. And God gave Israel the Sabbath as a remembrance of that deliverance. God's mighty hand and outstretched arm did more than just release Israel from slavery in Egypt. We read in Deuteronomy 26, beginning with verse 6. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried unto the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror and with signs and wonders. But Israel's deliverance didn't end there. Continuing in verse 9, and he brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God's arm brought Israel to the promised land, the land that God had promised their fathers and gave it to them as their home. You know, God's outstretched arm in delivering Israel from Egypt illustrated God's attribute of power. You know, this was a contest between God and Pharaoh to see who was truly God. And God tells us, Moses, about this in Exodus 7, beginning with verse 3. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my hosts, my people, the sons of Israel, from the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. And then in Exodus 9, God explains why he used this step-by-step -step method of dealing with Pharaoh. Exodus 9, beginning with verse 14. I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. But indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name throughout all the earth. You know, God could have just smote the Egyptians, killed them all in one plague, and let the Israelites go free. But he didn't do that. He used as many miracles via his right hand and his stretched out arm to show both the Israelites and the Egyptians his power and to proclaim his name throughout the earth. What is the lesson for us? You know, like the Israelites, God has liberated us from the condemnation upon Adam and his descendants, from being slaves of sin and has made us to be servants of righteousness. The apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who've called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once were not a people, but you are now the people of God. And even more than that, the Apostle John adds in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, we are now the children of God. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we will see him just as he had. We're just not the people of God, we're the children of God. Additionally, God shows his greatness by using the arm of the Lord to call out from among mankind, from the fallen depraved, community of man, a people for his own name to be spiritual sons, as Paul writes in Ephesians 1, verses 5 and 6 and 12. He predestinated us to the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved, to the end, that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Just as the liberation of Israel from Egypt was to the praise of God's glory, so will be the liberation and development of the church. In the discussion between God and Moses at the burning bush, God explains how he will fee, feel free the Israelites, beginning with Exodus 3 and verses 9 and 19 and 20. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. 
Pharaoh was not going to let the Israelites go because they were his cheap labor force. So God is going to stretch out his hand on Egypt to force Pharaoh to let him go. But God's hand didn't just cause miracles involving power. Verses Exodus 3, 20 and 21. I will grant this people favor in the sight of Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go, you will not go out empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters, and thus you will plunder the Egyptians. Through bondage, Egypt had stolen the labor of the Israelites for many years, and God's righteousness required that the Israelites being reimbursed for their labor. And so God's hand gave the Israelites favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and they spoiled the Egyptians as they left. God revealed that his outstretched arm would accomplish something else needed to free Israel from Egyptian slavery. Exodus 6.6, 6, say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from the burden of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and win great judgments. God would redeem the Israelites or buy them back, according to the original Hebrew text. And this is shown in the institution of the Passover, which took place before Israel was delivered from Egyptian bondage. And that Passover pictured the death of the arm of the Lord who would redeem all mankind. Continuing with verse 7. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord who brought you out from the burdens of Egyptians. And I will bring you into your own land, which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. After Pharaoh's army was overthrown in the Red Sea, the Song of Moses summarizes the work of God's arm and right hand in their deliverance. Reading from Exodus 15, beginning with verse 3. The Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army are cast into the sea, and the choicest of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. Your hand, or your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. And then continuing in verse 11 and 12, who is, who is like you among the gods, O Lord, and who is like you, a majestic in holiness and awesome in praises, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them up. God's right hand eliminated the army of Egyptians so they could never be a threat to Israel again. And in a similar way, God will use his right hand to eliminate Satan and all his associates so they could never stumble the human race after the little season. What's the lesson for us? The arm of the Lord provided atonement, which makes our deliverance possible, as we read about in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verses 12 and 24 in 1 John 2. Through his own blood, Jesus entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, but into heaven himself to appear in the presence of God for us. He is himself a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. Additionally, just like God, the arm of the Lord, gave Israelites favor in the eyes of the Egyptians, God, through his arm, makes all things work to our good. And finally, God will destroy Satan and his associates so that they can never pursue and plague the human family again. Following their liberation, the arm of the Lord continued to protect Israel as they journeyed to the promised land. We read in Exodus 15, verses 15 and 16, that then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed, and the leaders of Moab trembling grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they are as motionless as stone until your people pass over, O Lord, until the people pass over those you have purchased. 
the overwhelming power of the arm of the Lord over Egypt paralyzed its neighbors until Israel had passed by on their way to Egypt. Additionally, God promised to Israel, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion all the people among whom you come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you, and I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the lamb in land. And this was, and it was the arm of the Lord that did all of this. What is the lesson for us? The arm of the Lord is greater than all the foes that we will face in our Christian walk, as the Apostle Paul expresses it in Romans, the eighth chapter and verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? But in all of these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing or no one in heaven or on earth can separate us from the love of God that comes to us through his arm, our Lord Jesus. There is one more salvation for Israel, for the arm of the Lord perform. And we read about it in Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, beginning with verse 33. As I live, declares the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured up, I shall be king over you. And I will bring you out from the people and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I enter into judgment with you face to face. God will reign over natural Israel with his mighty hand and outstretched arm, our Lord Jesus, who will become their king. This hand and arm, our return, Lord Jesus, has already brought many of the Jews back to Canaan from the lands from which they have been scattered. And as we and as Ezekiel writes in Ezekiel twenty forty two, and you will know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the land which I swore to your forefathers. In the thirtieth chapter of Isaiah, the prophet describes how the arm of the Lord will bring salvation to Israel, beginning with verse eighteen. Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him. O people of Zion, inhabit in Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. You know, the Lord will be gracious when Israel cries to him, and God's answer to their cries will come, will come via the arm of the Lord, as we read in verses 30 and 31. And the Lord will cause his voice of authority to be heard, and the descending of his arm to be seen in fierce anger, and in the flame of a consuming fire, in cloudbursts, and downpour, and hailstorms. For at the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be terrified when he strikes with the rod. It will be the arm of the Lord that will dash the nations to pieces like a potter's vessel, as we read about in Psalms 2 and verse 9. In the 59th chapter of Isaiah, the prophet describes how the arm of the Lord brings God's salvation and righteousness, beginning with verse 15. And it was displeasing in God's sight that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man, no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. While the arm of the Lord has not yet been revealed to all the ends of the earth, he will be when God uses it to save Israel. Then, as Isaiah writes in Isaiah 52 and 10, the Lord has bared his holy arm 
in the sight of all nations, that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. But the arm of the Lord's work does not end with the saving of the nation of Israel or the dashing to pieces of the heathen nation. Its work continues with Christ's earthly kingdom, as the prophet Isaiah writes in Isaiah 40, beginning with verse 9. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him, his, recomp his recompense is before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lands and carry them lambs and carry them in his bosom he will gently lead the nursing ewes the arm of the lord will come with might to replace the nations with christ's earthly kingdom but then the arm of the lord will gather the lambs he will tend the flock he will carry them in his bosom so that the other sheep of john 10 the earthly flock may grow in righteousness and back in the harmony with god in christ's kingdom the arm of the Lord brings salvation, not just to Israel, but to the entire world of mankind, as we read about in Isaiah 51, beginning with verse 4. Pay attention to me, O my people, and give here to me, O my nation, for the law will go forth for me. I will set my justice for a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the people. The coastlines will wait for me, and for my arm they will wait expectantly. You know, God here is ex exhorting Israel to pay attention and to give heed to him and his law. But additionally, he says, God will set his justice as a light for all people. His arm will judge all people. And, the, and all people wait expectantly for God's arm. This reminds us of Paul's words in Romans 8, verse 19, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for revealing, for the apocalypsis of the sons of God. The creation is waiting for the arm of the Lord and his associates, the church, to bring them justice, to bring them salvation. The prophet Isaiah continues in chapter 51, explaining how the arm of the Lord has saved in the past and extrapolates that salvation to the future. Awake, awake, O oh, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old, the generations long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over? So the ransom of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. And everlasting joy will be upon their heads. They will obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. You know, it was the arm of the Lord that cut Rahab, representing Egypt, to pieces. It was the arm of the Lord that made a pathway across the Red Sea for the nation of Israel. And it will be the arm of the Lord that will raise up a highway of holiness and make sure there's no ravenous beast there so that mankind return back to harmony with God safely. So what is the lesson for us? Just as the arm of the Lord will fulfill God's promise to regather the nation of Israel in preparation for the new covenant, he will gather his church to their promised heavenly home, the new Jerusalem in the first resurrection. There they will receive glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. They receive the divine nature and become part of the spiritual family. They will be joined together with our Lord as his bride, as members of his body. They will become part of the Melchizedek priesthood, becoming kings and priests that will bless all the families of the earth. As we're told in Revelation, the second chapter in verses 26 and 27, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds unto the end, to him will I give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron as the nations, as the vessels of a potter are broken into pieces, as also I have received authority from my Father. The church is part of the Christ. Beyond the veil will assist in the work of teaching and leading mankind up the way of holiness to perfection and harmony with God. 
in conclusion, the arm of the Lord, our Lord Jesus, is on our side during all of the experiences of our Christian walk. This reminds us of the words God spoke to Moses in Exodus, the sixth chapter, and verse six. Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. You know, God is speaking these words to each one of us. As spiritual sons of Israel, this promise is applicable to us. God will bring us out from under the burdens of this present evil world. He has delivered us from the bondage of Adamic condemnation. He has redeemed us with an outstretched arm and with great judgments, and he will deliver us into the kingdom of his dear son. May we never forget the power of this promise in the remaining days of our Christian walk, and may the Lord add his blessing.